Listen Only mode. Hello, welcome everyone. My name is Sarah Carr and I'm coordinator for the Coastal Marine Ecosystem Based Management Tools Network, which is coordinated by NatureServe. Uh, and this webinar is also co-hosted by Open Channels and uh, EcoAdapt. And so we're very glad for our co-hosts and uh, Open Channels is represented by our, my co-organizer, Nick Weiner. And we're very pleased th today to have Ken Bagstad of the USGS uh, here to talk about valuing ecosystem services in the face of climate change in North Carolina and Hawaii. Before we get started and I turn this over to Ken, I wanted to let everyone know how to ask questions. So uh, we'll go through uh, Ken's presentation and then we'll have time, uh, dedicated time for questions at the end. Um, there's two ways to ask questions. You can raise your virtual hand. There's a little hand icon on your user interface. Uh, and then I can unmute you and you can ask this que your question directly to Ken. And we'll do this during the question and answer period at the end. Uh, this only works if you have entered the PIN number, uh, if you're using the telephone conference call, or if you have a working mic, if you're using your computer uh, audio. Uh, the other way to ask questions which is to type them into the question panel of your user interface and you can go ahead and type in questions throughout the webinar. Uh, we'll only, I'll only stop Ken to, to ask any uh, quick clarifying questions during the presentation uh, and we'll hold uh, the more substantive questions for the question uh, period at the end. But you can go in, ahead and send in questions in that format at any point during the webinar. Okay, well thank you again Ken, we're very glad you could be here and I'll turn things over to you now. Thanks again, Sarah, and thanks to the team at uh, EBM Tools for having me today. Um, I'll say just by way of uh, short introductory remarks that uh, this talk grew out of some uh, out of a presentation and a, um, a a group session at the ACES conference in December of 2012. And at the time, um, it was mostly uh, theoretical ideas about how to connect. Um, biophysically modeled and cultural ecosystem services and to link those to climate change and climate change impacts. And since then, we've had two projects start that I'm collaborating with, um, one with the National Park Service in North Carolina and one with the University of Hawaii, and uh, based in Hawaii, of course. And I'm uh, excited to be starting those projects, but this is, uh, this is work that's fairly, uh, fairly recently begun, so we won't have final results to present today, but um, we'll certainly be pulling it together within the next year and presenting results at, um, at some upcoming meetings and, um, and, and papers. So for those of you that are really interested um, about the final word, stay tuned. I want to start out by um, by acknowledging uh, a large number of folks. Actually, um, my first of all, the the PIs or co-coordinators on these projects are Kirsten Olison at the University of Hawaii, um, obviously on the Hawaii project, and Eva DiDonato um, with the National Park Service, um, who's been coordinating the um, North Carolina Ecosystem Services project. There's a group of folks um, to thank involved with the, uh, the North Carolina and National Park Services work. Uh, we kicked off that project um, in November of last year, so just two months ago, and a number of folks who were helping to make that happen. Uh, the Hawaii work is really just underway, but there's a large group of modelers and economists um, that are going to be involved with that that um, we're very excited to bring together. and. Um, and get that project rolling. And then there's a, several other folks I want to thank who have provided uh, support on, on a variety of different modeling issues and conceptual issues um, along the way over the last few years. So thanks to all those folks. I'm going to start out by, um, by providing a bit of a conceptual framework about linking the social and the ecological side of ecosystem services, uh, which I think is really exciting. Um, area of uh, future research and that I'm trying to um, apply to these two case study sites. Um, the North Carolina project and the Hawaii project, so I'll give a, an overview of the two and uh, how they're set up, what we are looking at and, and what we hope to find, and uh, then talk about climate change and its implications as they relate to ecosystem services, both on the science and the management side. 
So I'll start off um, by saying that there's a lot of ecosystem service tools out there, and that's probably not a surprise to anyone on this call, but least of all to the EBM Tools Network folks. Uh, this is part of a review that I did um, that was recently published on on specific tools for ecosystem services. So we were looking at uh, multi-service tools that can be generalized across multiple sites. And you can see there's a lot of these. And one of the, I, I think one of the important um, outcomes of that work, at least for, for my own uh, thinking, is the realization that uh, there, we're rarely in a situation where one tool fits all and that a mixed modeling approach and selecting the best tools for the job is, is really um, the smartest way to go, I think, with, with many of these ecosystem service assessment issues. Of course, one of the, uh, one of the leading methods for ecosystem service assessment is and has always been the biophysical modeling of ecosystem services. So taking GIS data, combining it with an ecological production function to produce maps of ecosystem services. Uh, and we can use those maps, of course, to look at trade-offs, at hotspots, at co-benefits, all of those types of issues in ecosystem services which have been really interesting and which a number of folks in the field have been very active in, uh, particularly over the last um, four or five years or so. There's a number of tools that accomplish this biophysical modeling of ecosystem services and do so in slightly different ways and out of slightly different paradigms, too, that um, may be familiar to some of the folks on the, in the audience and that I'll talk a little bit more about today are um, the ARIES project, Artificial Intelligence for Ecosystem Services and the INVEST uh, tool, Integrated Valuation of Ecosystem Service Trade-offs. So I'll, uh, I'll give some more concrete examples of using both those tools and, and some others uh, as we proceed today. To add on to the basic ideas of GIS data and ecological production functions. One of the areas that I've been working on, and this is, um, this is an area we've specifically emphasized uh, in development of the ARIES toolkit, is looking at the spatial flows and spatial relationships. And these are really important. Uh, basically, the, the, the key idea is that uh, ecosystems produce um, through eco ecological and ecosystem processes, uh, they produce benefits or potential benefits that uh, people may enjoy. Um, the, there are obviously people, different beneficiary groups who, who can benefit from different types of ecosystem services that are located at certain areas on the landscape. And there's a connection between the two, the connection between sources of ecosystem services, the, the in situ places that could provide uh, ecosystems and their beneficiaries. Um, so there's, there's often a spatial and temporal flow um, of ecosystem services that matters as well, and that's represented by these gray arrows in this diagram. The last part, um, which is fairly new, uh, which we introduce in this uh, framework and in this forthcoming paper that I note, um, is the idea of sink regions, areas that may deplete a flow of ecosystem services, and that could be a good thing in the case of um, of services or, or of, of an ecological flow that uh, provides sort of a disbenefit, anything like a flood flow, uh, unwanted sediment or nutrients, that type of thing. A, set of, a sink feature could be a good thing. It could be a bad thing in the case where, they de where a sink depletes um, some beneficial uh, thing for, for beneficiaries. So it's, it's service specific, but what this does uh, is this framework gives us a consistent language and a consistent modeling approach for thinking about ecosystem services and, and their spatial and temporal dynamics. And um, I'll talk some more about some of the uh, implications for coastal and marine ecosystem services, of which there are several um, important ones as we get a little further along today. The second piece of the puzzle, aside from biophysical modeling, is cultural ecosystem services. And um, we've had a couple of important papers in the last two or three years that folks have put out that have talked about how it's been hard to map and value cultural services. And uh, that's true when you think about the biophysical perspective. But there's, there's another way to do um, cultural ecosystem service mapping, and that's just to ask people 
what parts of the landscape they think are important and for which types of cultural ecosystem services. So using survey-based methods. And these actually have um, over a decade's worth of research that have been done related to them in the uh, social sciences literature in particular. And that literature has not always been well integrated into the, quote, mainstream ecosystem services literature, but, um, but there are, I think, some promising ways to do that and some very good reasons to do that, um, which I'll, I'll describe in a bit. Essentially, we have a list over here on the, on the right of potential cultural ecosystem services and non-use values. And what we can do is we can give survey respondents a list of those um, cultural ecosystem services, a description of each cultural ecosystem service, and we can give them a hundred hypothetical dollar or dollars or points that they could allocate across those different services. And so it's a stated preference exercise where each person gets to allocate the same amount of points. We can then directly map out those points, as some have done in the, in the PPGIS or public participatory GIS world. Uh, we can also apply tools such as the Social Values for Ecosystem Service tool, which some of my colleagues at USGS have developed, um, to map out, to model and map a value surface for these um, cultural ecosystem services. And there's a lot of this work that's been done. Um, some of the main locations have been in national forests in the Rocky Mountains. Also, there's been a lot of work done in coastal and marine settings, which is, of course, um, important for this group. And one of the more exciting things about this method is that rather than just being a series of one-off studies, um, there it provides a means to potentially transfer values and, um, and get data for regions where we don't have survey, uh, have original survey data. I'll talk about that some more as we go on today. So again, what we do is we ask people to allocate value between those different value types and to put points on a map for places they value. And once we have the location of the value points and the weightings for the different social value types, we can combine them with relevant environmental data that we may that we th think may have a relationship to how we um, model these particular cultural values. And we can use um, the SOLVES tool, which includes the Maxent algorithm, to interpolate, to model and interpolate a value surface across the area of interest. This example here is for aesthetic value in the Pike San Isabel National Forest in southern Colorado. And that gives us a value, what we call a value index, uh, which provides values from 0 to 100, or 0 to 10, actually. So this isn't a monetized ecosystem service, but it is a quantified ecosystem service, and we can use that combined with biophysically modeled data, as I'll show in a moment. And then there's the potential to transfer value, for instance, to look at an, a national forest next door um, to the one where we have data to use the relationships we derived in this study, along with environmental data for the second national forest, and to map and model uh, cultural ecosystem services using solves, uh, using a value transfer approach. And several of my colleagues, Ben Shrouse and Darius Simmons, are actually testing out that, um, these approaches uh, right now and uh, looking at where, uh, where they will and where they won't perform well and um, developing guidelines for value transfer. So to, to harken back to this mixed methods approach here, um, I mentioned the likely unrealistic paradigm of one model fits all. We have deterministic models. Um, many of the process-based ecosystem service models that um, biophysical scientists are familiar with and have developed over the years. And some of the ecosystem service models, which have attempted to synthesize and summarize those models, um, where we have good data availability and we understand systems dynamics very well, uh, those are very strong uh, candidates for us to use in modeling. When we lack data or have uncertainty and data may be uh, weaker or more uncertain, probabilistic approaches uh, may be more appropriate and uh, may carry some, some real benefits in places where it's just not feasible to run deterministic models. And then uh, in a 
And then the bottom half of this Venn diagram here is, uh, is post-public participatory GIS and social values mapping, which is particularly well suited to cultural ecosystem services, which uh, many of which would be hard, if not impossible, to try to biophysically model. So the framework that, uh, that we've developed that we're currently testing um, at s several sites in the Rocky Mountain uh, region in the National Forest, and I'll also be testing in the North Carolina case study, is to look at um, both the biophysical ecosystem service delivery and the public perceptions or the social values of ecosystem services. And we've done this as a two-by-two two matrix, and we're looking at different ways to identify hotspots for biophysically modeled and publicly uh, perceived ecosystem services. And one of the things that, uh, one of the reasons we're doing this is to look at uh, the management implications of what these different hotspots may mean. So in cases, um, we've, we've got a two-by-two two matrix that we've uh, developed here. And in cases where ecosystems are providing a lot of value and the public recognizes that value is important, that likely means that um, there may be a lot of support for an ecosystem services-based management approach if the social values are compatible with the continued provision of ecosystem services. If not, we may have a, a case of conflict and need to be looking at um, ways to try to resolve that conflict. If we have high social values, places the public values, but places that aren't providing a lot of ecosystem services according to our models, those would likely be places where, uh, where the public could be encouraged to keep doing what they're doing. Um, there wouldn't be ecosystem services impacts in those cases uh, associated with public use of a particular area. If we have high ecosystem service models, and, uh, or values rather, and um, low public perception of those values, the bottom left quadrant, uh, those may be cases where if, if an agency or a manager really wants to or needs to um, raise public awareness and support for that activity, then um, some form of outreach may be necessary to, uh, to build support for that. And then if we have low, um, low modeled provision of ecosystem services and low areas um, that um, are, are not recognized as important by the public for ecosystem services. Those may be areas where in a multi-use context, um, extractive resource use or heavier use of the landscape um, might be more appropriate, assuming there aren't other issues with, um, with biodiversity, endangered species, or cultural heritage, for instance. So uh, the, the first implementation we've done of this, uh, of this four quadrant uh, linked ecological and social um, ecosystem service modeling has been in the Pike San Isabel National Forest in southern Colorado, um, some distances from the coast, I realize, but, uh, but we'll get there soon. And uh, what we've done is to combine the results of a social values survey for residents that live near the forest. Um, we've generated the uh, value surfaces for the social value types. We've run biophysical models using ARIES for four different ecosystem services. And we've looked at, um, we've looked, so we've built a layer of combined social values and combined biophysically modeled values. We've, um, we've then done the overlays and run hotspot analyses using the Gettysburg GI tool, which helps us look at statistically significant hotspots. And we get this type of results. This is another map of the forests and of the forest, I should say. And we get some areas that are in the high, high, some that are important for um, biophysically delivered ecosystem services and or social values. And then, uh, and then what we might call cold spots, the areas that are low for both of these. And so we can think about back to that two by two matrix and what that might entail for planning in some of these different areas if there were uh, particular areas that the that forest managers were concerned with. Um, we're working on extending this analysis to five other national forests in Colorado and Wyoming and to thinking about the implications for forest planning. But again, we, we can, um, we think, use the same sort of approach in a coastal and marine context as well. Um, this overlay just shows, uh, shows one interesting finding from these forests. And the black outlines uh, are wilderness areas. 
and the uh, the triangles here are 14,000 foot peaks, which are well well known, well recognized, and uh, valued spots for recreation and view sheds in particular. And so that shows where we can look at the relationships of some of the landscape features that uh, that might be behind uh, some of these important values, both on the public perception side and on the uh, the biophysical side of ecosystem service provision. So moving on from the theoretical and from the work um, in the middle of the continent, hundreds of miles from the coast, I'll, uh, I'll start in on our uh, ecosystem service valuation pilot with the National Park Service. And um, two or three years ago, we did some work with uh, BLM and put out a report that's shown here that was looking at um, what ecosystem ser service tools are out there on the tool landscape, if you will and testing out a couple of those and looking at their resource requirements and trying to see which ones are uh, potentially feasible for BLM to use in their decision making. So th this was, uh, what's interesting about this is it was a geographically focused case study. We did this work in southeast Arizona. Um, so we were specifically mapping and modeling ecosystem services for a particular site and management area, but we were also had an eye toward agency-wide application. If BLM were to use the information um, in decision-making across the agency, how would they do it and how would it fit in with their existing decision processes? So the Park Service was interested in, uh, in doing something similar and thinking about how um, park planning um, interfaces with ecosystem services, ways that may be similar or different from, uh, from BLM, an agency with, with a different type of organizational mandate. And so we, what we are doing for this pilot is to uh, pilot test the approach for Cape Lookout National Seashore in North Carolina. When we think about ecosystem services in the Park Service, um, some of the ecosystem service flow concepts I, I talked about a little bit earlier uh, become really important. Anyone who's dealt with parks and protected area management uh, recognizes that uh, protected areas are rarely a, uh, rarely if ever, a self-contained, fully functioning ecological unit. So, um, so what happens with the management of private lands around a park impacts processes within the park and uh, has some serious implications for um, ecological integrity, for visitor experience, uh, for the, the long-term future of a protected area. On the flip side, um, parks provide benefits. Um, you know, they're, off, they're often minimally developed. There's often relatively intact ecosystems in parks, and so they can provide a lot of value for their surrounding communities. And whereas many parks have had, um, had pretty narrowly defined economic assessments done on them for years, number of visitors, visitor spending, um, economic multiplier studies for the benefits that parks bring to communities, uh, there haven't been as many studies of, uh, of the, the other types of ecosystem service values parks provide for their surrounding communities. And this, this diagram on the on the right shows some examples of, of cross-boundary flows in a hypothetical park situation. So um, in North Carolina, we are doing for Cape Lookout a social value survey, and uh, we're actually serving several different user groups. In uh, the fall of last year, um, the, some colleagues of ours at the University of Idaho administered a survey to surf fishermen and they'll be um, putting out another survey of visitors next summer for uh, summer beachgoers, uh, two very different groups who may use and value the park in different ways. And we're also going to be surveying uh, residents of the, of the county um, who, are, who actually live near uh, the park over this winter and spring. And so we, um, as I described in the social values mapping slides earlier, we ask people to allocate value among a series of 13 different value types. This isn't all of them, but this, this is the, the text description of the types of value that, um, that an area could provide and that might be important to people. And then we give them a map and we say, um, we say place your, lo your locations on the map for where you're interested and where you think um, are important for providing these different value types. We give them some some relevant uh, geographic information, some place names, in the case of uh, Cape Lookout, some ferry landings, and some important um, 
recreational features within the National Seashore. Um, so we can see Cape Lookout, um, since this is the first map I've shown of the area, it's on the, um, the eastern Atlantic shore of North Carolina, and it's a barrier island system. Um, this is actually a national seashore that's just south of Cape Hatteras National Seashore. Um, so there's these two uh, national park units that form a good deal of the barrier island system of North Carolina. So that's the social values side. Um, to get at the biophysical side of ecosystem services, we held a stakeholder meeting in November 2013 and um, went down to Beaufort, North Carolina and met up with um, a number of scientists and members of the community and other organizations. And we went through a guided brainstorming and prioritization exercise to look at um, what ecosystem services matter to people, what data sources do we have, to um, to populate models and what existing models can we can we draw on, and which new ones uh, should we be thinking about um, building and testing for this area? So the the services that rose to the top were coastal storm protection, fisheries, and sediment and nutrient impacts to water quality, and those are. Uh, not surprising, I think, in a coastal context, probably things that uh, that many coastal managers are concerned about in different fashions. So just to describe these a little bit, um, obviously a barrier island system, very important for, um, for mitigating wind and waves in a hurricane-prone region of the country. And so we're interested in looking at the difference between potential hurricane damage with and without the barrier island system. We've got some nice data that um, some of our colleagues at USGS out in the east have put together on uh, hurricane-induced coastal erosion hazards. So we have some ideas about um, what the what the uh, coastline can do in terms of coastal uh, storm mitigation. And we have data on lives and property and park service culture and historical resources that could be at risk of um, of wind and wave damage. Um, so. All these are going to be put together in a series of models, and we're still fairly early in the effort, but um, we'll be using these data sources and these beneficiaries to quantify the value of uh, coastal storm protection provided by Cape Lookout. Fisheries, not surprisingly, extremely important. Um, this is the uh, this is a group of recreational um, fishers on the island uh, in November, which is a uh, high season for um, for fishing, um, in addition to recreational, of course, subsistence and commercial fisheries matter quite a bit. Um, seagrass areas that are sheltered by the barrier island system are very important nursery areas, so they can provide um, spawning and rearing and uh, nursery areas for um, a variety of, um, of marine life at, that are important for uh, from a fisheries perspective. So we'll be pulling together data on fisheries and trying to look at the links between um, seagrass and other habitats within the park and providing, um, providing fish which are um, used by um, a variety of different commercial subsistence and recreational users. And then lastly, we'll be looking at water quality. And water quality is an interesting issue in this part of the world. Core Sound, um, which on this map is right behind the, um, the core banks of Cape Lookout, actually has a lot better water quality than the Albemarle and Pamlico sounds to the north, uh, which, drain, uh, which get drainage from a much larger area. And they have a lot of heavy, intense agriculture um, going on in those watersheds. So uh, water quality isn't as bad in Core Sound, but there was a consistent, uh, consensus among our, our stakeholder group that things aren't quite right either with water quality and that we need to look at um, the linkages between um, land use in the parks outside of, outside of the park boundary and how that um, may impact water quality. So we'll be looking at sediment and nutrient in, inputs to core sound and other water bodies and thinking about how those impact other ecosystem services. So uh, this project I mentioned, we really just got started in it, on it in October, November of 2013. Um, really over this winter, spring, and summer, we're going to be wrapping up the social values mapping and working on biophysical modeling. 
uh, putting the report together uh, later this year and uh, working with the community scientists and managers on how we can use this information with an eye toward broader application of ecosystem service concepts in the national parks. So moving on um, to the exact opposite side of the country, um, the other project I'll be talking about today is, is an upcoming project in Hawaii. I'm looking at uh, the relationship of, um, well, spatial relationships um, from our ridge to reef approach, uh, which is um, well known and very important in these coastal um, coastal mountain areas that combine mountains and, and coral reefs and other um, terrestrial nearshore and aquatic ecosystems in a, all in a very compact geographic package. So this is a project that's a larger goal is to look at coral reef ecosystem service values, to look at them in a spatial context, and to look at the potential impacts of those ecosystem services uh, due to changing land use practices and to climate change. So our target area is uh, the west coast of Maui, which um, you can see the island of Maui here. Um, this is a, um, an exaggerated vertical relief of the island, which is looking, uh, we're looking from the west towards the east. And what you can see here is that the west coast of Maui, we have, um, we have um, mount, very steep mountainous areas with forests. Um, as, the, um, as the landscape flattens out, we get an agricultural zone, and then right along the waterfront, we have quite a bit of development, uh, the reds and uh, pinks. And those are, uh, those are of course, largely tourist, um, tourist infrastructure and facilities, hotels and other, um, and other facilities. That light blue band, which is fairly thin, on the west coast of Maui, but which you can see surrounding some of the other areas of the coastline, is coral reefs. So there's a narrow band of coral reefs that are located right in front of, um, of these, this developed land. Those reefs, of course, are getting uh, runoff from the mainland, sediment, nutrients, and um, freshwater runoff, um, that, which is going through an agricultural zone. It's going through developed landscapes. So the reefs are getting a lot of inputs of sediment and nutrients in particular, which can be really harmful for them, in addition to all the impacts of climate change. So um, how do all these play, to, um, how, do, how does all this interplay uh, impact ecosystem service values and thinking about um, landscape management that can promote continued provision of ecosystem services um, by these important coral reef systems. So there's a lot, um, there's a lot that's um, involved here. Um, um, and there's, um, excuse me, um, there's a number of ecosystem services that are important that we're going to be looking at more closely. Um, the top ones, um, similar to North Carolina, fisheries, coastal protection, tourism, and cultural heritage. A lot, a lot of similar issues are coming into play. Right? The biophysical processes I mentioned uh, include sediment and nutrient inputs off the land, the um, natural process of wave mitigation that reefs provide, and the climate change impacts to reefs, which we need to, to figure out how to model and consider in a scientifically accurate way. And then to think about both the, the current and future value of reefs under um, different uh, scenarios for land use and climate change, and a variety of different climate change impacts to, to these reefs. So this is the general, um, this is just our broad brush overview of, of the things the project will be considering. Um, I mentioned a mixed modeling approach earlier. Um, we'll be using the same approach here. Um, the Coral Reef Scenario Evaluation Toolkits to look at some of the, um, the coral characteristics and the influences in ecosystem processes. Uh, the INVEST Coastal Protection Module and using ARIES to look at uh, some of the environmental flows that are important to coral reef ecosystem services and to those, um, those natural runoff processes. And the overall goal is to combine these into a workable toolkit for West Maui that will predict um, and value ecosystem services accurately. But, uh, but to keep a larger eye on how we could do the same um, sort of thing for more broadly for other Pacific Islands uh, which face conservation challenges associated with coral reefs, land use, and climate change. 
So I mentioned this um, this project at, a, at an early stage as well, um, where we'll be involved in developing and testing models, um, particularly in the next um, six months, but but likely throughout the year, and then um, developing our recommendations outreach and publication in 2015. Um, this is just another diagram of the the sort of interlinkages between land use, population, policy, and climate scenarios, which have effect on the biophysical side, and um, and impacts to ecosystem services, uh, which we which we need to figure out how to value and how to look at in a spatial context. So backing up to think more broadly about climate change, both within the context of these two projects and um, at an ecosystem service perspective, um, the first step would obviously be to identify the major drivers in any kind of scenario exercise. We need to think about what are the drivers of change and how do they impact um, ecological processes, social processes, and ecosystem services. So sea level rise, one, an important care, uh, consideration for both case studies. Um, tropical storm intensity and frequency in North Carolina, um, impacts to fish communities in both cases, um, ocean temperature impacts to corals, ocean acidification, and uh, being specific to Hawaii, and then some of the land use base changed as, as, they, uh, as, as they may interact with climate change to, um, to change inputs of freshwater sediment and nutrient flows um, are things we'll need to consider in both case studies. So we're still, for the most part, working on um, these, these climate change scenarios. For North Carolina, we know that we want to test sea level rise ranging from two-tenths of a meter to one meter above the current sea level. So we have, some, uh, we have a, a set of possible uh, occurrences there for, uh, for how climate change could drive changes in ecosystem services via models. Uh, we'll be doing the same thing for Hawaii to determine um, what a reasonable set of climate scenarios are. So for the time being, um, we're left without um, the, the quantitative results are, are a story that we'll be able to tell um, within the next year or so. We can start off with some hypotheses um, about ecosystem service provision and use, and this should actually say likely trends in ES provision on the left and in ES use on the right. And, um, I'm going back to the disconnect, which we've talked about, which I've talked about throughout um, the presentation about the points of service provision and the points of service use and the importance of looking at both of them and looking at them independently and linking them uh, via spatial models. So what we can see is that in many cases, the demand for ecosystem services on the right side of this, uh, of this graph is likely to go up. Um, and in many cases, the supply of these services is likely to go down. So if we have lower supply and greater demand, we expect that the services will be getting more valuable. Not necessarily a good thing, which I'll talk about in a moment. Um, same case in Hawaii. Uh, you know, we have some uncertainty about some of these uh, some of these ecosystem services, but in terms of potential supply and demand trends, a lot of um, a lot of likelihood that um, that ecosystem service supply may be in decline due to climate change, population growth, urbanization, these processes that we foresee going on into the future, and yet demand for these services uh, rising at the same time. So when we combine that supply and demand information, um, population growth obviously is is going to give us more beneficiaries, an uncertain climate, um, more demand, especially for regulating services. When uh, you know if the if the impacts of climate change are forecast to be um, big changes in the um, the existing um, you know precipitation, temperature, and other natural patterns, then we would expect that that some of these regulating services, in particular, um, may uh, become higher value. At the same time, if, uh, if people are relying on some of these services more, again, speaking in broad brush strokes, um, we might expect uh, greater potential ecosystem degradation. If there's greater reliance on some ecosystem services, we may see uh, even more areas that are, are getting overused. So um, if there's a way to decouple 
the demand for ecosystem services um, from their supply, at least partially. And when I say, when I talk about um, decoupling, I'm, we're talking about adaptation, technological substitutes, ecosystem management, and demand side management for these ecosystem services, ways to ease the pressure on ecosystems so that um, they're not getting uh, stressed from both climate change and the impacts of climate change and from increasing human use on the systems, um, that's, that's maybe um, one easier said than done path forward toward um, trying to maintain and grow resiliency in an, in an age of climate change. The flow-based assessments that I talked about um, are important, uh, again, because um, many existing ecosystem service tools and assessments have just looked at how much of a service could an ecosystem provide, how much water, how much nutrient mitigation, what kind of view quality, et cetera, um, for different ecosystems, how much can the ecosystem supply. And that's useful. Um, I'm calling it here a theoretical ecosystem service provision, and we've called it that in some of our, our existing publications that we've put out thus far. Um, but um, that theoretical provision, which I've showed in a map on the upper right for some work in Puget Sound in Washington State, is not the same as the actual use of ecosystem service. And for actual use, we have to think about where the beneficiaries are located and how they access this ecosystem service. So in many cases, actual use was quite a bit less than the amount of theoretical provision. Um, and we can see that for view sheds here. There's a lot of potentially um, visible, uh, beautiful areas in Puget Sound. Many of the areas aren't in, uh, in viewable access of, uh, of homeowners, um, who are in this case, we've, what we've done is we've taken, um, we've modeled the potential provision of high quality views. We've looked at the location of people who may enjoy those views in the form of homeowners on the landscape, and we've looked at what they can actually see, and we see that it's a lot less than the total. Now, population growth and a more dispersed um, pattern of human settlement might mean that we're utilizing more of the landscape. It might also mean that we've degraded the landscape's ability to provide that service. So we might see greater ecosystem service use, and we might actually see degraded per theoretical provision under a situation where we had widespread urbanization, which is, in fact, um, a paper that we're working on for these data in Puget Sound. Um, but what these can so, so this can tell us some things about sustainability and maintaining natural capital stocks. It can also tell us about um, monetary valuation in that we wouldn't want to value areas that are just theoretically capable of providing an ecosystem service. We want to value the benefits that are actually delivered to people. So, uh, so this flow-based information we'll be using um, in tandem with monetary valuation and value transfer to try to build a stronger uh, theoretical foundation for that in a spatial sense. So overall, I would hinted at this earlier, but if we have higher demand and rarer ecosystems, we may have greater value but lower resilience. And on the flip side, we want to ideally, in a management context, be thinking about increasing ecological and social resilience. So um, again, the importance of thinking about the, um, both the supply and the demand side of ecosystem services, particularly in the context of climate change. And, and we don't have to look very far to find examples of, um, of climate change change having severe impacts on, on human communities just within the very, very recent future, or recent past. So um, I'll close by talking about um, thinking about broader scientific goals and how to apply these tools more widely. One of the real interests in our work with BLM was could we take these tools after applying them to a case study site and bring them into day-to-day decision-making. Um, for the BLM, and Park Service will be asking the same question. And we, when we started to look at spatially explicit ecosystem service models, what we were finding is that there are roadblocks to that. Many of these models are too resource intense, to say nothing of, of locally specific models, which may rely on local data and require even more time, um, money, and resources to um, develop, parameterize, test, run, and, um, and to actually apply. So we started thinking about 
ways in which we could take the existing models and apply them and lower the barriers, I should say, to their use in regular decision making. So for the ARIES model, um, I haven't talked about this that much um, over, the, over the course of the presentation. Um, very briefly, ARIES is intended to be a modeling um, framework that, that um, is an integrated library of ecosystem service models and data sets that can run those models. And those models and data are semantically tagged, which means they have consistent, um, consistent names and consistent meanings so that when we ask for um, elevation at one site and altitude at another, we're, we're going to be getting the same thing. We're going to be getting elevation above sea level, um, for instance. We're not going to have two different, uh, differently named data sources that we can't uh, choose between. And we're, uh, and we're going to be able to pick between the models and the data sources that are most appropriate for the given ecological and social, socioeconomic context. So, um, so that's the intent of ARIES in a nutshell, is to build a, uh, a library of models and data that'll be very, that'll be automatically tailored to the context of interest. And once that comes together, um, ARIES should be a much easier to use tool that won't have to be uh, built out for specific case studies each time. Of course, individual case studies could be done um, and they may be more accurate, but we'll at least be able to say something about the spatial nature of ecosystem services in any context um, that we care to, care to apply. The other piece is in um, WCS and WFS supported data archives, and those of you who are deep into the GIS world um, may have played around with WCS and WFS. I'm not going to talk more about those here, except to say that they're really powerful in terms of data sharing and, and data interoperability. The Invest tool, um, I've, I've used Invest myself and for anyone else who has, um, I know one of, the, um, one of the more time consuming parts of Invest is in getting the right data and the right model coefficients for your area of interest. So, um, so having more of those, um, having them well documented, having them um, in a central location where future users can draw on existing data and um, to, to parameterize those invest model coefficients could definitely help and um, the invest teams recently pulled together a database for several of the services um, that's available for their website that just does just that which is uh, really exciting in terms of lowering the barriers to applying invest in new regions um, again there's always like any like any knowledge transfer exercise there's going to be um, you know a process of being careful and doing it the right way, but uh, but some of the information is going to be there, which is which is a real step forward. And I think in both these cases, for Aries in, and and Invest, uh, there's been a lot of meta analysis done on the economic literature to look at ecosystem service value, uh, meta analysis of the ecological literature to better understand um, ecological processes could help quite a bit in those cases. I mentioned that solves can um, can um, potentially transfer values between sites um, when looking at the relationship between the biophysical and um, the expressed public preferences for ecosystem services. Um, that's increasingly possible and that, that will hopefully be tested in the next couple of years as there's a number of coastal sites shown here um, where solves has or is being applied in the U.S. And there's, of course, ways to speed um, survey data collection, which would, uh, which would help out quite a bit in the collection of any kind of social science data, um, which um, some of our colleagues who are using this tool are investigating ways to, uh, to, try, to, uh, to try to get around these barriers. With that, I'm going to um, leave it open for questions. And um, thanks again, everybody, for attending. OK, thank you, Kim. This was great. Um, First of all, I'll remind everyone how to ask questions. You can raise your virtual hand, and I can unmute you, or you could type in your question uh, into the question panel, and I'll relay it to Ken. Um, and one question that's come up several times already, yes, uh, a PDF of the PowerPoint slides will be available, as well as a recording of this webinar. And so if you want to get uh, links to those once they're uploaded, uh, please send me, Sarah Carr, or shoot me an email. Uh, it's Sarah underscore Carr at natureserve.org, uh, and I'll send you the link once they're posted. Uh, so let's see. There was a question, uh, are 
are aqua, is aquaculture in both North Carolina and Hawaii being considered in the ecosystem services models? Um, it's not, and I'm more familiar at the moment with the North Carolina case study, um, given that it's um, it's a national park. There isn't, uh, there certainly is an aquaculture going on in the um, within the bounds of the park, um, within the surrounding area. It wasn't brought up as a uh, as a strongly important service, so not something um, we're considering. My my guess is that the answer is also no for Hawaii. Um, again, we're at an earlier stage there, so. Um, We'll know more soon. Okay. All right. Thanks, Ken. Um, then sort of a two-part question. Are these projects being done in advance of land use planning processes? Uh, I'm interested in learning how to use the inform this information in communication and outreach strategies and how it might be used for developing ecosystem service markets payment strategies. Yeah, the um, again the North Carolina example for sure is um, we we selected Cape Lookout because it's um, it's going through a uh, the park planning process and so there was an interest in seeing uh, within the existing um, NPS planning process how can we um, how can we use ecosystem service information so there's there's definitely going to be a focus with our work and in the final report for that project on how to uh, how to use ecosystem service information in planning and decision making um, again i'm going to i'm going to plead ignorance on the uh, on the hawaii project for the moment i'm afraid just cuz that's at an earlier stage okay all right thank you very much um, and then let's see there was a question about how you're surveying people and mapping values. Are these in-person surveys or online surveys? Um, well, for this case, um, for this case, were um, the visitors to the seashore are being given paper surveys um, that they can then either fill out themselves and uh, return at the when they're um, talking to the interviewee, or they can. Um, they can save it, put it in the mail um, when they have a chance to fill it out, or they can go to a website. So there, um, so there are um, there are websites um, available for this that have been set up. And the same thing will go for the resident surveys. It'll be a mail survey, of course, but um, they'll get the paper survey, or they'll have the option to do an online survey. And of course. Um, you know, like any survey method, we can do in person, we can do mail surveys, we can do online surveys. Um, so um, different methods have been used in different applications of the Solves tool. If it's helpful, I'm happy to add another slide before I give the PDF to Sarah, which gives the URL for um, for some past online um, uh, websites for solve surveys that will give an idea of what the, the survey instrument looks like when it's online. I'd be happy to do that. Sure. I think that would be helpful. Thank you, Ken. Uh, people, I think uh, some people really appreciate that. Okay. Uh, let's see. And another question. Um, how do you choose the, uh, well, I think you answered some of that, uh, the public for informing the values and that uh, you just uh, let's see. Can the models be used to assess alternative sea level rise mitigation tools such as hardening? Yeah, I think so. Um, you know, we're we're going to be looking at um, different different scenarios and responses. So, um, I mean, the key to any model is thinking about the interface points between a management action and how they affect the models. And if we can, um, you know, if we say that we're going to harden a particular area, which is probably in, in this case more relevant to Hawaii since it's not a park service uh, context, um, how does shoreline hardening um, affect um, wave mitigation or beach access or some other um, type of ecosystem service, fish habitats uh, versus you know, say some kind of coral management strategy. Um, so yeah, I think, I think the, the, as a management question um, that'll you know, maybe not specifically shoreline hardening, but other um, other land land or water-based management um, will be looking at how those feed into the models, 
and then how can we, um, you know, effectively turn on a layer in the model that would uh, that would be equivalent to a hardened shoreline, and um, see how that affects ecosystem service um, provision. Okay. Thank you, Ken. Okay, and you mentioned you used a guided process for identification and prioritization of ecosystem services by scientists and other local experts in the North Carolina study. Was this interview process a methodology you developed or something already established, and, and do you have a citation for the methodology? I don't have a citation for the methodology. Essentially, um, it's it's pretty simple. Essentially, all we did was, um, which we've done uh, in the case for the BLM work uh, as well, is to um, is to give an overview of what ecosystem services are. To go through a very open brainstorming process where um, where the um, you know the participants are allowed to talk about and explain anything that they think is e is an ecosystem service or is related to an ecosystem service, then we um, then we sort of pare down our list. We eliminate redundancy and we eliminate some things that that uh, pretty um, obviously aren't ecosystem services. And then the final step is to um, to do sticker dot voting, um, where people prioritize their top three ecosystem services. So. Um, you know, it's it's just that kind of guided process in terms of a citation. I wouldn't have anything, but um, but you know, we've we can describe that process certainly, and and I think it's worked fairly well for involving the public and and uh, you know, making them feel that they have critical feedback in defining the project scope. Okay, and the questioner said thank you for the response. Um, there's how are the economic values derived? Is it through the survey or through benefit transfer methods? Um, well, in terms of if, if we're talking about monetary values, um, then in most cases we're going to be doing some form of benefit transfer. I mean, I didn't talk at all today about um, any of the traditional econometric approaches to valuation. But um, one of the things that we're, that we're very interested in is combining past studies with information about ecosystem service provision, use, and flows, and um, and the potential changes to those as a result of climate change or other resource management. So, um, so yeah, it'd be it'd be value transfer and thinking about how to how to apply value transfer in new ways based on um, based on um, that flow information. And we've we've this is a pretty new process. We've described some ideas about that in the um, in an upcoming paper on Aries, which is going to be forthcoming in PLOS One. Um, but uh, but concrete examples um, we're going to be working out for the Hawaii case study. Okay, thanks, Ken. Um, and unfortunately, we are not going to be able to get to all the questions. They will all be available for Ken to see. Um, but I suggest if you really want uh, an answer that you contact Ken separately um, with that. Um, that being said, we can still cover a few more. Um, do these projects assess, assess ecosystem services and social values related to public lands only or a mix of public and private land? Well, we uh, that's a great question. We definitely are looking at a mix of lands and a lot of, thinking back to a lot of the social value studies that have been done so far, many of them have been public land focused, um, but not all of them. Some of them have definitely looked at adjacent private lands, and especially given um, given the sort of matrix of public and private lands and the, the flows that go between them, it's important to look at the whole landscape. So for the biophysical side, the answer is a definite yes. We look at we look at all the areas for the social values mapping. It's um, you know it depends on the folks who are developing the survey, but it's it's mainly been used for public lands, but uh, and waters, but it certainly could be used for private private as well. Other than you get into questions about access um, as well, and you know will people know and be able to respond about an area that they don't know because it's private land and they've you know they don't have access. Okay. Um, and let's try going to Elizabeth and see if we can hear you. Elizabeth, you there? Did you have a question for Ken? 
Uh, no, I must have hit something back. Oh, uh, okay. Sorry, Elizabeth. I think your your hand might have been uh, up accidentally. All right. So one last question, um, which might be too early in the project's answer, but it's an interesting question. Uh, coastal and marine spatial planning has been labeled too contentious a topic in some political areas to reference directly. How are policymakers accepting ecosystem services frameworks for helping to inform decisions? Well, I think in the discussions we've had, um, it's been positively received. And one of, one of our hopes as we do these projects and others um, is that uh, by thinking about both the social side of things, the places people value, and the ecosystem services that we can really um, get at um, some of that conflict resolution and try to be more proactive about um, identifying and um, and more and more positively um, dealing with conflict areas. If you know, if we just map biophysically important ecosystem services, um, it shows important areas that may be really vital for human well-being in the area. But, um, but by knowing as on top of that what areas people value and for what reasons, if we, uh, if we can identify places where those, the existing use it isn't compatible with ecosystem service provision, then we've at least taken a step to um, try to spatially identify a conflict zone. And um, that, that could um, help in the process of uh, reducing that contentiousness. So I think, I think the combined biophysical and, and uh, social values mapping has a lot of promise. Um, and, and the f managers that we've talked to have been very interested in it for some of those exact reasons. Great. Thank you, Ken. Um, this was a fantastic presentation, and uh, this is, I mean, fascinating work, and we look forward to following it uh, over the upcoming years. Um, thank you to everyone who was able to attend today. We're very glad that you could be with us, and hopefully you can attend one of our upcoming webinars as well. Um, yeah, and again, thank you, Ken. This was great. And so, yeah, thanks, everyone. Appreciate your time and interest. Okay, and uh, have a good, great afternoon, everyone.